Finance. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, as before, they should rise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary. Clerk, would you please read the question? To ask the Minister of Finance to outline his plans to safeguard jobs and support businesses during the COVID-19 outbreak by providing support through the non-domestic rating system and any other measures within his department's remit. I call the Minister for Finance. Uh, I am acutely aware of the extreme pressure on businesses and households at this difficult and uncertain time. There are already a range of reliefs and measures available to help both household and business rate payers. Further information can be found on, the both, on both the NI Direct and the NI Business Info websites, and people can contact Land and Property Services if they wish to discuss alternative payment plans. My department have been working over the weekend and is actively looking at options to provide additional support to businesses. I spoke with executive colleagues this morning to discuss options on how best we can support ratepayers, and I intend to make an announcement on this shortly. I call Andrew Muir for a supplement. Thank you very much, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement. Um, the COVID-19 issue is, as I've said, a public health emergency and also a rapidly developing economic crisis that risks workers' jobs and livelihoods if their employer's company collapses. But also businesses are worried sick uh, about the difficult decisions ahead and the risk of bankruptcy after investing so much time and money into their businesses. And I would like to ask the Minister when about she feels to be able to bring forward these measures to this House, because people are looking for decisions and looking for direction very, very quickly. I know the Scottish Government brought forward their package on Saturday, and other governments have been bringing forward their packages in recent days. And also whether he will issue a direction the Government will not enforce statutory payments uh, within his gift, including the payment of rates during this crisis, bearing in mind that many businesses will be struggling to pay and will be unable potentially to make these payments. Thank you. Minister, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I fully understand, as I say, the, the issues that are facing businesses, and we want to put together in place a package which recognises that there has been some movement from Westminster, and that has given us some scope uh, to put together a package. We also have our budget, which we're setting, and again, I think we can look at the issue of business rates within that as well. We can look at the issue of timing uh, of rates bills, uh, and also the other supports that were mentioned by other ministerial colleagues as well. Uh, in terms of timing of announcement, of course, uh, the, the executive meeting this morning was interrupted because we, we had to come into chamber business, so now we have to conclude the executive uh, meeting as well. And so any proposition I make in relation to spending money or foregoing money that might otherwise be available to the executive requires uh, some executive approval. Uh, and so as soon as we can get that, I intend to make an announcement as quickly as we possibly can. I call Paul Given. Mr. Speaker, the executive rightly stepped in uh, with urgency to avoid the uh, cliff edge when it came to welfare mitigations and those that were facing that financial extremity. Uh, can the minister assure us that the same urgency will be applied when it comes to the cliff edge that businesses now face right across Northern Ireland and that there will be a reprioritisation uh, within budgetary expenditure that focuses on ensuring that our economy can get through this crisis? Well, we are in the position, firstly, that we, we will be able to announce some support measures as a consequence of decisions that have been taken in Britain. And, and from my understanding, that's the first in a series of measures. So we would expect to get ongoing consequentials for support uh, for business and other issues, because uh, COVID-19 will affect not just the business community, it affects uh, cross department, particularly in relation to health, obviously. Uh, and so there is an urgency about trying to support that. There is a recognition that there was a very full discussion in the executive this morning a recognition about trying to face the crisis that this uh, particular issue is creating right across public services, uh, particularly in, in relation to the economy, but also in relation to other services as well. And of course, we have the opportunity to set the budget uh, because we delayed to be on the 11th of March. Uh, and so quite rightly, the budget will want to focus on response to this crisis. Uh, but bear in mind that doesn't just involve the uh, business and the economy, it involves support for our health services as well. 
uh, and the other services that may struggle as a consequence of what's coming at us. So, uh, of course, there are opportunities both in terms of the initial support that's come across uh, and also in terms of setting our own budget, but we have a range of issues to consider as part of that. I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for uh, answering the questions. We are certainly in unprecedented times, and business in particular is extremely worried about the impact this is having uh, on our economy and on them, and, uh, and for the welfare of their workers as well at this uncertain point. Uh, as you will know, Minister, in Straban, there are many uh, large businesses such as O'Neill Sports, Frylight, uh, 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 and, and others that uh, employ workers from both sides of the border. Can the Minister explain? Uh, what the, the lockdown in the south would mean for those businesses and what support uh, your department would provide to them, and also if there's any conversations around taxation, VAT and the sorts with HMRC? Well, some of the issues that he raises are the concern of the previous minister who just spoke in relation to taxation and, and VAT and discuss uh, with the Treasury around support for business in that regard. The, uh, I mean, we're not in a lockdown situation as yet in the south, so obviously workers can travel across. We're in I suppose different emphasis in terms of social distancing and social restriction, uh, and obviously that's creating significant concern. And as a border dweller myself, I, I know the implications of having two different approaches uh, in such close proximity, and the, the uncertainty, added uncertainty and concern that that causes communities who live uh, right across those areas. So, of course, we want to offer all the support we can. We want to provide reassurance. Uh, to industry and to business generally, we, we want to make sure that the economy continues to function as best it can in, in circumstances which recognise the health uh, difficulties that are coming at us, uh, but continues to function as best it can. And we want to be able to provide all the support we can to that to ensure that that continues to happen. That is measured against the support that will be required, particularly for the health service, but for other services as well. I call Rachel Woods. Mr Speaker, I wish to ask the Minister of Finance on the fiscal plans that he and the Minister for the Economy mentioned to stimulate and support business and staff in Northern Ireland. When, we will, when will we get sight of this and how long do you envision this recovery package lasting? Well, one of the difficulties with having to come into the Chamber to do business is we actually interrupted the executive meeting to take the decisions, but that's, that's, the sitting is fixed for today and members are entitled to get up and ask questions and raise these issues because they're hugely important issues for all of the constituents that we all represent and they want to hear us talking about them in this Chamber. So, uh, ironically, it has interrupted actually the speed in which an announcement can be made. So we are hoping uh, to be able to give some sense. Uh, of, of some of the measures that will be made available in the, in the near future to assist businesses. We obviously, this is an unfolding uh, crisis and we're going to have to monitor so on. We're going to have to uh, monitor, I would imagine, because we don't have that data now, what particular sectors of the economy are affected by this. Uh, at the moment, you know, uh, I'm sure, like yourself, we have heard from virtually every sector of the challenges that this is going to present. Obviously, some sectors will be affected worse than others, and tourism and hospitality has been spoken about. Uh, so I think we, we do need to make some immediate measures, interventions, uh, and monitor this on an ongoing basis, assess what might become available from Westminster in terms of that approach to it. Uh, we have a budget to set. Uh, we have, I've asked uh, executive colleagues today not only to uh, work out what their bids may be in relation to specifically dealing with this, but also where spend may not happen as a consequence of what's happening in terms of shutdown and slowdown uh, across various department responsibilities, so where they can actually redirect some of their own resources into tackling this crisis. So this is an unfolding issue, as, as the member will know. We will try and get decisions as early as we possibly can to give some degree of confidence going forward, and we'll obviously have to monitor and readjust those as time goes on. And they call Jim Allister. I ask the minister to look afresh at the efficiency and uh, suitability of his hardship relief scheme within the department on rates. He will be aware that in a recent answer to me, he indicated that in this current year, there have only been nine successful applications to it. In the past five years, the success rate has been in or about 25%. Does that not suggest, having regard to the hardship that business is passing through, that that scheme is not fit for purpose? and needs to be revisited and made more usable by those who are in hardship? Well, I, I, I don't disagree with the member. I, I think the hardship fund hasn't, the hardship rate relief fund uh, hasn't really uh, been as effective as it could have been. 
uh, and I think that we will want to look at that. It is important to, re to remember, though, if any ratepayers experience difficulty, they are encouraged to contact LPS at the earliest possible opportunities. In most cases, payment arrangements can be put in place that will assist. But I do accept its criticisms of the hardship fund, and I do think it's something that the Department, in terms of the overall rate review going forward, needs to look at. I call Mervyn Storey. And thank the Minister for the answers he's given thus far. A comment was made by the Economy Minister early in relation to uh, fiscal stimulus, and obviously there has been a lot of talk about uh, a rates holiday. And I, I noticed that uh, Chamber of Commerce have written to both the First and Deputy First Minister today. Uh, and the issue that is, I think, perplexing to many businesses in Northern Ireland today is not that we are waiting for some medical diagnosis. To, to, to determine what our response will be. They know now the challenge financially that they will face. And what can the Minister tell us in the House he will do in relation to the rates relief, a rates holiday, so that businesses today will have some certainty in relation to how they will deal with this crisis? Well, the member will know, as he was previously in my position, that I have to, I have, to have that discussion with executive colleagues and get some sense. And we did want to make the announcement that the, the, the enormity of the issue that we're dealing with this morning meant that it was a much more lengthy executive meeting and a much fuller discussion. So that was kind of parked, and we intend to revisit that later uh, on. I think the executive is restarting now as we speak. Uh, so I, I'm keen to get back to that to, to develop these propositions. He, he should know that the, the, and I, I heard other members raise this issue with the economy minister. The extent of the package that the, the British government has announced in, in terms of the race holiday would cost in excess of two, £200 million. The Barnet consequence that might come to us is probably less than half of that. So if the executive, and that's a matter for the executive, were intent on following that through in full for businesses here, given the, the, the difference in terms of our approach, then they would have to find that money from elsewhere. And if that's a decision they take, that's a matter for the executive, and they have to try and, and, and discover that money from another source or to cut other uh, budgets accordingly to meet that. Uh, and that's the, that's the extent of some of the challenges facing us. But that's not to say that there is not a determination within the executive to try and meet this, to try and recognise the very real difficulties they are, and to, to try and provide whatever support we can to business. They call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for coming and answering questions today. I appreciate everyone's time is of the essence at the minute. I want to ask him two quick and related questions, and I'll make them brief. First, given that of the four big banks in Northern Ireland, two, uh, one of which um, is part owned, I think about 14% of the Bank of Ireland is owned by the Irish state, about 60% or more, possibly 70, possibly the whole bank actually of the Allied Irish Bank is owned by the uh, by the Irish state, and about 60% of the Royal Bank of Scotland, which owns Ulster Bank, is owned by the, basically the UK Treasury. Can he have, will he have urgent conversations, along with the Economy Minister, with his counterparts in London and Dublin about what kind of liquidity, what kind of genuinely political leverage we can place in those institutions, because that's basically our entire banking sector. And the second question I want to ask him, reflecting what my colleague from South Belfast said earlier and reinforcing the fact that if this is on the news tonight and if anyone's listening and you're going to the Holy Lands tomorrow, don't do it. Would he a, reinforce that message for B and t B say the same thing to publicans in Newry who might have people who might have the temptation of people coming up from Dundalk or even further afield to say, don't open your pub and if you're coming from over the border, stay at home? But can I say in relation to the first part of his question, of course the, the economy minister has signalled that and I think uh, both the first and deputy first ministers will be having discussions with uh, with uh, uh, banking uh, interests and of course as part of our discussions with both governments there was a, a meeting more specifically focused on the health issue but I know there is a desire and a plan to have further intergovernmental meetings over the, the next uh, short period and I think that issue should be one of the items on the agenda to try and ensure that you know on the one hand what the executive is doing with public money is not contradicted by what banks are doing with, with private uh, lending and, and uh, liquidity issues. Uh, I, I absolutely concur with them. Uh, I think uh, Michelle O'Neill put it well uh, yesterday when she said, you know, this is going to be a different St. Patrick's Day. It's not going to be the same as normal for younger people. And, and for some young people, there's an air of invincibility about them, and they think that they won't get these illnesses. They may well not, or they may well survive them. But in coming into contact and potentially passing them on, they have to take into consideration their, their, their family members, their siblings who may have underlying health in, uh, uh, issues, their grandparents, uh, for whom contact with that could be fatal. Uh, and so I would re re really urge younger people to think and act responsibly tomorrow. I know the vast majority of young people are doing that. I know there's a significant number of people in the hospitality industry are already 
voluntarily taken steps to deal with that. Many people have closed their premises, and I have to admire them for that because that's a real financial challenge for them at a time when the, 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 the season, if you like, for tourism is starting to kick off, and St. Patrick's Day usually hurls the start of that. But I think a lot of people are socially responsible, and they recognise we're into a very, very serious issue, one which we have not ever experienced before in our lifetimes, and that that requires very serious action socially. So I would hope that both premises owners and, and people who, who feel like going out tomorrow reflect on all that and take a decision to stay at home and, and, and celebrate St. Patrick's in another way. There will be another St. Patrick's next year, and we'll be out at the end of this. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Childcare and childminding small businesses are vital to the economy. Will the Minister commit to early engagement with childcare providers to help them to survive and help us to respond to the coronavirus public health challenge? Well, I have to say that there is a request from very, virtually every single sector in business. And I have to be honest and say if I'm going to commit to engaging with every sector, I might not be able to do what I need to be doing in terms of providing support for all sectors. So I'm not saying I won't engage them, but what I am saying I can give a reassurance uh, to people in the business community that the executive is urgently looking at what support measures we can put in place. We want that to assist all businesses, and we recognise the very particular challenge. Because I also recognise that if child care sectors go out of business, even if there's a return to full normality after that, these businesses are needed then to allow to assist in that return. So there is a particular importance attached to that facility to allow other workers to get back to work and carry on to rebuild our public services and the economy on the other side of this crisis. So it, I do very much recognise that, but uh, I have to obviously, uh, I, I suppose, allocate my time wisely between doing the necessary business of the department and with other executive colleagues and actually getting out and engaging with, with people in various sectors. Call Gordon Dunn. Minister, for his efforts on this issue. Can the Minister give some assurance to the small business sector, those especially in the High Street, those that still remain, that you will look very seriously at the issue of, of rates? Uh, the large supermarkets are obviously will gain from the recent influx of business, but are the small businesses that left in the High Street are struggling and really do need help at this difficult time? Uh, can, yes, I can assure the Member that uh, certainly we will look at that. I, am, I mean, in the very short term, some businesses are benefiting, particularly those big supermarkets. Uh, but that may well not last for much longer. This, this situation is evolving day by day, and patterns are changing day by day. So it's very hard. Uh, I mean, it was only last Thursday some announcements were made, and we moved from kind of social restriction on large numbers down to almost discussing lockdowns within the space of three days. So this is a very fast evolving situation. Uh, and of course, we're looking at, if you like, in, in a two phase. One is the immediate support we can give to business to try and ensure businesses can stay open, that staff can remain employed, that, that we're not putting pressure uh, on, on the social services that people end up out of jobs and businesses end up hitting the wall. So we want to do that in the immediate term. And then we, we have a budget to set, and rates is going to be a central part of that budget. And if you like, in the third phase of that, we are engaging in a whole scale review uh, of, of rates issue generally. And what we want to do is improve that situation for business. So we have three attempts. And, Whatever else may come from Lutton as, as partner consequences in the meantime might be able to assist specific pa packages for specific business. So, as I was saying to an earlier question, it's, it's not possible at the moment to thoroughly assess which particular sectors are going to suffer the most. So, I think we need to support all the sectors initially, and then over time we'll be able to assess who needs specific interventions. I call Justin McNulty. Tom Corla, and can I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. I em empathise with the concerns and fears of businesses and employees in the mouth of this unprecedented COVID-19 uh, crisis. Our job here is to give them reassurance. The Minister I know will, will be familiar with a gentleman called Phelan Quinn of Quinn Coaches who came into my office on Friday. Family run business uh, who have 10 employees, 14 tour coaches, 20 years in business, have never missed a payment. Um, overnight their April order book was wiped out. The same applies, you know, they, they don't know where they're going to get their money from. They don't know how they're going to stay in business. The same applies for small businesses like Minus 20, the Shelburne McCarries, Hartford Copeland's event management business, the Brass Nugget, even Grains Nurseries, multiple other businesses in our constituency minister. How can you and the economy minister work together to ensure the appropriate fiscal stimulus packages, supports, and rates holiday, if necessary, will be put in place to give these companies and businesses reassurance as well as their employees? Yeah, and I think the member points out well in that the business he's, he's named go across the entire range of the business spectrum. 
So it, it would be something if we were very sure that this was hitting a certain sector and we were able to uh, direct support to that. What we have to do is come up with a way to try and support business in general in the very immediate term uh, to look at the issue of if there are further interventions coming uh, in terms of support packages from London, where those are directed once we get a clearer idea of the sectors. And of course, coaches, uh, I've had, I have a contact from coach companies as well who are in that tourism sector immediately uh, feel the effect of, of a drop off in bookings. Uh, and they're almost in the, the first line of that. Uh, and, and so we, there is a recognition that hospitalities and tourism and all of the associated businesses uh, are going to really struggle as a consequence of this coming into the season, which should be their busy, busy season. Uh, and so we need to, to, need to try, find a way to make those direct interventions uh, to support business in general. And then as time goes on, both through our own budget, uh, through other Barnet consequences that may come our way, and through the rates review into next year then to specifically target those uh, who are in need the most. Let me call Claire uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I welcome that the Minister is about to make a, a statement on um, some sort of uh, relief package. Can I ask, can we expect um, rate relief or uh, rates delay? Well, it may well be a combination of both. And I call Jonathan Buckley. Speaker, um, Minister, over the, the course of this past few weeks, we have listened intently to yourself as you have outlined the severe pressures facing our public finances. Given the unfolding crisis, we know that that is going to get a lot worse very quickly and over a sustained period of time. Does the Minister agree with me that over the course of this next uh, few weeks and months that this executive must refocus its priorities in order to meet this uh, unfolding crisis locally? Yes, I, I think so. And I think to be, be quite honest, it wasn't for this reason that the executive delayed its budget, uh, but coincidentally, I think this, this actually allows us to focus the budget over the next two weeks. And there's a budget going to be coming here on the 30th of March to actually ensure. I've already asked departments to come forward with plans and bids for specific measures to tackle coronavirus. To obviously do that collectively in the, as an executive, but I've also asked them this morning to look again at some areas of spend, which, given the unfolding circumstances, may not now be done by departments. You know, some areas that, that they intend to spend money in, which is not, are, will not be possible over the short to medium term, and to refocus uh, their spending plans in relation to directing them towards this crisis. So I think there are opportunities for us to try and, uh, and, and channel as much support as we can to tackling this crisis. But the member well knows that we have very limited resources. Uh, you know, even with additional support from London, it still is our limited resources, and we have to use them as wisely as we can. I call Mark Durgan. Uh, Mr Buckley there touched on the inevitable impact that this situation is going to have on this assembly and executive uh, departments and their ability uh, to function. Has there been much conversation or discussion or, or thought across the executive about the impact that this might have on our legislative uh, programme? Minister, in particular, I'm thinking of legislation required promptly to extend welfare uh, mitigations, because I think it's vitally important that we know what we're doing or if extraordinary action needs to be taken to ensure what's the worst situation any of us will have experienced doesn't become even worse. Well, can I say that that probably is a, is a function for the Speaker? And I am aware that there, uh, not only just departments are making plans, but this institution has to make a plan that if it can function in the way it does currently, and I noticed that there's only a few of us practicing social restriction over this end, uh, but if it can function the, the way uh, that it normally was, I think it's incumbent on all of us to ensure that the democratic function of this institution can continue uh, and that we are, enable, we are able to pass the necessary legislation that will make an impact because we can't allow that to fall. Uh, we discussed it this morning uh, at the executive uh, an emergency bill specifically in relation to coronavirus and some of the range of measures that are required for it. Uh, and that legislation will have to be done very quickly. And then there are other associated uh, pieces of legislation which will obviously assist people as they personally face into what might be very challenging times in terms of job losses or uh, reduction in income uh, and all of the, the problems that go along with that. So I think it will be a matter for the Speaker, and I have no doubt uh, from what I have heard that there are already discussions happening as to how this institution can continue to function in what might be challenging circumstances that we may not be able to secure full attendance at, or it might not be wise to secure full attendance at. And I think I know in the Dáil uh, there are suggestions that they are looking at a kind of reduced presence of TDs based on kind of the hunt 
uh, numbers that you know uh, uh, appropriate number from each party turn up, but that it's not crowding the place, if you like. And uh, you know, I'm sure there are other options that we look at the assembly here, but it's essential that we get all the necessary legislation passed that we have to do. There are no other members indicating to speak. That therefore concludes the uh, this item of the business, and I want to return to the uh, renewable heat incentive inquiry report. And the first speaker I call is Claire Sugden.